so I don't know if you want to see this, but I'm glad I'm glad that you can. <laughs> um, and so um, thanks for having me. It's always been um, fun to be the foil for the uh, TBI and Sales Science Foundation uh, Motion Preservation conferences. Um, I'm happy to be here, and it's it's still not too late. So. Um, cervical disc arthroplasty, a less commonly performed surgery for multiple reasons. Uh, I have financial disclosures, um, which don't really have anything to do with this. Um, certainly one of the, you know, sort of most under-recognized financial disclosure that most people have is that we get paid to do spine surgery. And, um, you know, that is always a consideration whether it's um, explicitly discussed or not. So... Um, George Bernard Shaw said once that if history repeats itself and the unexpected always happens, how incapable must man be of learning from experience? And so, you know, I would take that to say that most revolutions fail. You know, the, the um, hip resurfacing was a terrible disaster um, because you're trying to unseat a, pr a pretty successful surgery. Um, just despite what we just heard about... Um, that total lumbar disc replacement is can be an excellent surgery. It really has not been widely adopted. You know, a, a, a coflex in, in many of the indications are used to replace a laminectomy. Again, hard to beat the king. And Jefferson Davis is really just an, you know, a side note at this point. I <laughs> mean, um, so this, the, the, these are the things I want to talk about. A little bit of some thoughts about ACDF. And this is less of a, you know, sort of cite papers as more of a, and more of a hand waving, you know, this is the way that I've um, come to think about these procedures. Uh, I'm unlike the other two speakers tonight, I'm going to try to stick close to the 15 minutes that were allocated to me. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about ACDF and disc replacement um, with many, many apologies to Alan Hillbrand. Um, you know, is ASD even real? Uh, talk just a little bit about financial considerations and then I'll put my nickel down. So the history of ACDF is well described and, you know, sort of one of the success stories of, of the um, spine world. Uh, first reports are in the fifties, um, you know, 70 years of success and, and really still is the king with 70 plus percent of anterior surgeries in the neck. Um, you know, one thing that I think is, is different and there's a, a slide and a couple, um, a couple down the line, which draws a, a attention to this as well, is that these early papers were really reports about surgical techniques. And that is one thing that's different about the um, rise of the CDA um, literature is that they're really, those are really reports and descriptions about um, implants. Um, ACDF is very appealing because it removes the compressive lesions. Uh, and then there is some direct benefit to elimination of motion. I mean, there are there's a, a likely a percentage of the nerve irritability that is new to due to dynamic factors. Um, you know, there is some hope to arrest mechanical pain with facet driven neck pain, uh, and resorption of osteophytes takes place even if you don't get them the first time. And and you know what I always like to tell people is like, have you ever seen a ten year out MRI, uh, MRI after ACDF? The index level always makes the surgeon look much better than they likely were at that time, because over time, all those compressive lesions sort of resorb or regress. Um, and, and this slide is really, and I, I made a point to cut and paste this basically in, in the disc replacement section, because I don't think it's really too different. Very successful results for cervical radiculopathy, incredibly long-term follow-up, um, high likelihood of elimination of arm pain and, and normalizing activity level. Um, same thing here, really, that the, the benefits of ACDF for treating cervical myelopathy are not, um, in, are not superior for the most part to the same, to, to treatment of this disease with, uh, disc replacement improvement or, you know, it really, and really it's about stopping progression, but most people have improved in their gait and balance or improvement in their hand strength, maybe some improvement in neck pain. And, and that's one, one situation where, I, although I know there is literature to the contrary, it, it never makes a ton of sense to me um, why we would expect improvement in neck pain uh, with a mobile with a mobile device. You know, not that it it creates neck pain, and I don't mean to suggest that, but if if pain 
is begotten from motion, why would this replace make it better? And so, you know, again, I think all these things just are, are meant to show that it's hard to beat the t total hip replacement of the neck. It's a, it's a really successful workhorse, durable operation that's been around forever. Um, disc replacement, um, first U.S. reports are in the 2010s, maybe a little, maybe a couple, a little bit earlier than that. This is one um, that Dr. Geyer uh, published along with Dr. Cork, who had the opportunity for the, for the um, probably third or fourth year in a row to run into it. Our Roth, he comes to our Rothman alumni uh meeting in the summer and he is he is a piece of work he's a wild man um and this literature is really different it reads very differently than this this than the uh um acdf literature in the sense that this is really a device driven literature um you know there it has a long success record this at this point as we heard um in the last talk uh, same as lumbar disc replacement you know, there's still obviously there are always persistent concerns to some extent regarding the next level just because it moves. I mean, it's, you, you can't put that level to bed in the same way that you can with uh, ACDF and a successful fusion in which you'll really never have another problem at that, at that location. Um, not specific to disc replacement or anybody sitting in that room, um, but the risk of confirmation bias is always higher in early adopters you know, people are into the, they're, they like the operation, they want other people to like the operation. And that's just something that I think as you read some of the literature that is device driven and not technique driven, you always got to be a little leery of. Um, disc replacement removes compressive lesions, does not eliminate motion. So, you know, the, there would potentially would be some, um, you know, not, less likely circumstances where the, uh, dynamic sources of nerve irritation would not be addressed. Um, you know, again, there's the questions about why would it get rid of mechanical pains driven by like facet loading or something like that. And you also wouldn't expect t time wouldn't make you look better in a poorly performed disc replacement where time may make you look better in a poorly performed ACDF just because of the lack of motion, the resorption of osteophytes and um, ligamentum flavum and all that stuff. Um, Ten-year out MRIs may not look as pristine as they do with a fusion. And so, you know, it, it, it is very likely a, a less forgiving operation. Um, Dr. Hilbrand always says, you know, it, it's, it's hard to do. It's, every surgery is hard to do really well. It's not that hard to do an ACDF passably. And again, time is maybe on your, on your, um, on your side after that. Um, the indications certainly are stretched beyond the, those laid out in the ID trial. Um, particularly in surgeons who perform many, many CDAs just because not everybody is a perfect candidate. Um, and, and I think when you take a step back, this is one of the most interesting things to me. And I, it's magnified actually in the lumbar, um, I think in the lumbar disc replacement world, which is there is still not a ton of buy-in. I mean, like for an operation which has a very, very deep body of literature suggesting it's similar in terms of results, this is represents no more than a quarter or 30 percent of, of anterior base surgery and in the lumbar spine is, is far far less um it should have the same results like i said mentioned before for radiculopathy and for the the direct decompression aspects of myelopathy again there's the neck pain issue and, and i know that there are papers that suggest that's not true but it, it doesn't make any sense to me so i would say the results are probably mostly equivalent um yeah, again, with apologies to Dr. Hillebrand, um, one of the early project, um, you know, descriptions of ASD, I still am like, after having spent many, many, many hours looking through um, uh, tons of papers from the 2000s and 2010s, I, I really, it's hard for me to take a step back with a 10,000 foot view and say like, ASD is real and is not a consequence of genetics in people who are predisposed because they had the first surgery um, to disc degeneration, disc herniation, you know, bone spur formation, bone forming diseases, all these things. Natural history is extremely difficult to disentangle um, from uh, adjacent segment degeneration and disease. And, you know, in that setting, you know, the disc is remarkably durable. I, the basic science lab I run studies disc degeneration and in particular painful disc degeneration. The rate of symptomatic cervical disc degeneration really varies little based on all these factors, which you think would be bad for disc cells and, and bad for the disc as an organ. Um, the extra biomechanical burden based on the disc, while it's been shown in like cadaver studies to 
um, you know, increased motion and things like that, it may well be well within the ability of the disc from a biologic standpoint to accommodate. And, and in particular, um, you know, there's wide variation from person to person on their ability to deal with stress to the, to the disc. Again, sh really driving home the um, genetic underpinnings of disc degeneration. And so I, I'm, it's not clear to me ASD is real. If ASD isn't real, in some ways, the house of cards of disc replacement comes crashing down, um, especially at, at you know, one or two level surgeries where the loss of motion is relatively trivial. I mean, to the point where survey studies don't really show that patients can discern a difference in losing five degrees of motion or eight degrees of motion. Um, you know, that, that's one thing that is very interesting to me is if, uh, you know, and it's obviously it's a contrived discussion, but is there an advantage to that where people would still want to pursue performing disc replacements in the absence of um, ASD as a motivator? Um, really, really briefly on financial considerations, um, you know, this I think is um, evident to everybody. Medicare pays less for disc replacement than it does for uh, ACDF. Those differences are often magnified in the um, private insurance space. Um, you know, without going through our contracts at, at Rothman Institute, ACDF pays about twice what a disc replacement. And I cannot imagine that that is a unique set of circumstances. Um, the reality is that this likely influences practice patterns nationally. Um, and, I, and I think that probably is part of the influence you see, not as dire circumstances if you're trying to get uh, a lumbar disc replacement approved by insurance, which is a bear. Uh, but it, it probably weighs into a certain extent. And in conclusion, I don't think there's a big difference between these two studies and or two operations in terms of operating room time, risks, outcomes for the most part. Adjacent segment disease isn't your fault. This is the patient's fault once, it's, once they fuse the first level. Um, same level problem for disc replacement is your fault in the way that the patients look at it. I think it has a longer track record, better pay. So I would just say, keep it easy. Don't try to unseat the king. Disc replacement is wildly successful. Make your life easier and do it. Thank you.